participated. Uh, we also want to thank the presenters this afternoon who have graciously accepted to do so on behalf of you uh, as we, we go through this very important exercise in, in terms of shaping the, the budget for next year and over the, the medium term. So we have uh, some remarks from the Honorable uh, Prime Minister. This will be followed by uh, some 10 minute presentation, very short uh, to the point uh, from various stakeholder groups. We will then have an open dialogue and we will of course bring the session to a close thereafter. We uh, will be accepting or receiving your comments uh, on Facebook and wherever else that you can comment. Uh, and so we, we encourage you to participate fully in this important, important exercise. So uh, friends, colleagues, without further ado, I want to take this opportunity at this time to invite the Honorable Prime Minister to uh, give his brief remarks. Over to you, Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Pia Sylvester, and a pleasant good evening to you and to uh, everyone who's joining us uh, virtually for this consultation. Uh, let me take the opportunity to uh, adopt the protocol list established uh, by you and to thank everyone for coming on um, on a Thursday evening that's overcast uh, to be part of this, this process. The budget consultation um, is, is pivotal and key to what's assisting us as a new government and still to some extent in transition uh, to start pivoting the strategic focus uh, of the government in relation to the policies uh, and particularly or policies as outlined in our manifesto, which form the basis for our campaign and uh, form the basis for us uh, being in government. And so while in one sense, um, we are not fortunate enough uh, to have had a lot of time uh, between the elections and uh, they need to prepare for a new budget, uh, the consultations underscore um, for us, the importance of getting uh, active participation from the nation, active participation from stakeholders in the budget process. And so I'm uh, truly grateful uh, to all of you who are on this call and to all of those who have uh, prior to this call uh, been part of the budget consultation process. Um, we want um, ordinary citizens to be part and parcel of the process uh, because while uh, the cabinet, while individual ministers, while MPs, uh, while the budget officers, uh, Pierre Sylvester and his team at the Ministry of Finance, uh, may come up with uh, budget proposals and while they may be adopted by cabinet and um, ultimately form the basis of an appropriation bill. Uh, if we do not have the input uh, from persons, if the budget ultimately does not reflect the goals, the aspirations of the people themselves, and if they do not believe in it, um, then in a sense, uh, our strategic focus um, and our goals and objectives will not reflect the desires and, and the wish of the population. And so it's absolutely important that we, we take the budget process and the consultation seriously, um, because the truth is, you know, there are some places where the ability of the citizen to take part in such a process does not exist. Um, and so we see it as fundamental to the democratic process, and we see it as a wonderful opportunity for um, stakeholders to help shape uh, the government's policies, the government's strategic focus uh, and the agenda. And so I just want to take the opportunity to say, um, as we run this program, that for persons to engage earnestly with us, um, to be frank, but polite, um, and uh, to be strategic in, in terms of some of the things that we, we discuss. Uh, naturally, uh, we have a very ambitious um, policy agenda. Um, a budget only operates um, in an annual cycle, but we have to bear in mind uh, that there are medium term and long term goals that we, we need to address. And so we expect that uh, this really is the transition phase, and particularly this budget cycle will begin setting the foundation for us to uh, aggressively pursue our transformation agenda. Um, I don't think I need in this room to go through in detail some of the key areas that as a government we've indicated we wish to focus on. Um, but that really is, uh, this, this cycle really is the start of that process. Um, and so we expect 
um, that those who are with us this evening um, will bear that in mind. Uh, we'll look to provide constructive criticism. we we'll look to provide uh, possible solutions, uh, suggestions as how we can use the budget process to in fact begin the transformation phase um, that we think the country um, badly needs. So I just want to thank all of you for coming on. Um, I think tonight is a, a night for me to listen more than to speak. Um, and I want to encourage all of us to actively engage in the process. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your well-focused and thoughtful remarks in reiterating the importance of this exercise and, of course, setting the stage for the rest of the discussion. At this time, we would like to invite Ms. Siobhan Britton, who will do a short presentation in terms of an overview of the feedback we have received as part of the consultation uh, across the, in the, in the various uh, stakeholder consultation and parish consultations. And, and to basically look at what were some of the emerging themes from, from, from those consultations. Um, so over to you, Siobhan, at this particular stage. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Uh, good evening with protocol established. Good evening, everyone. So the presentation that I'm doing now will be twofold. The objectives of the presentation, one second, is as follows. First, I will just give a, a, an overview of the consultations that were held and then speak about a, a brief synopsis of um, the general themes, the emerging themes that came through during the consultations. So we had basically two segments of consultations. We had stakeholder consultations where we met with specific groups of, of individuals and associations. And these were largely held on a virtual, a virtual format exception of the consultation with the youth and the agriculture and fishery sector. So all the other consultations listed here were, were, were virtual consultations. And we have stakeholders here from those particular groupings who will present on what was discussed in those meetings and what they would like, um, what priorities they would like government to focus on um, based on that particular, those particular meetings that we had. So um, I will not speak to those because they will speak to them later on in the, in the, in the meeting. The second grouping was the parish consultations, which we started in Carico and Peter Matnik on the 22nd of September, and it ended last night in St. John. Um, so we def we had consultations every night um, for the last few days, and at this juncture, I really would like to thank the hardworking staff of the Ministry of Finance um, who, were, who were part of this process, because literally because the consultations were from 6 to 8 p.m., and uh, sometimes going on to after nine because the people were so engaged in the conversation. Um, we were literally working night and day. And I know it was very taxing on some of us. So I really want to express um, my appreciation for the dedication of the staff um, throughout this process. Additionally, I would like to thank uh, GIS, FLO, uh, Ministry of Education, as well as the school principals for organizing the venues for us. Ministry of Youth and Sports, um, Agriculture, Caracol and Pitimatic Affairs as well. We collaborated with them to pull off some of the consultations and as well the stakeholders and the general public for coming out and really having open and honest and frank conversations with us. So we, we do think that the, the engagement works as, was success and we really thank you um, for coming out and, and supporting us with this initiative. So I'm gonna to speak to a brief synopsis of the broad emerging themes and I will speak to them in, in the context of the government's five overarching pillars that were identified um, in the ANTAP. So we have economic transformation, um, environmental management, citizen, empower citizen empowerment, um, governance and institutional rebuilding. And the fifth pillar is foreign policy, but we didn't really have discussions on those. So we left that pillar out. But just to say what came out of these consultations. So three main points here for economic transformation. There was a lot of conversation about the ease of doing business on digitalization as well as um, major infrastructure overhaul needed in the country. And I will speak to them in broad terms. So in terms of ease of doing business, there was a call for us to really streamline the processes that we have um, integrating technology in our day-to-day -day business, as well as in some of the, the, the our regular practices. And by technology, we may not necessarily mean a computer per se, but a, a new way of doing something or a more efficient way of doing something. And it was noted that in some of our processes, like even in the construction sector, the world has moved on from, 
from basic paint brushes and so on, and using different tools to, 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 to get the job done. So we should really look into how we can integrate new technologies into our, in, into our economy to help them be more efficient and effective. Also, I um, mean, especially in the outer parishes, there was a, a call for the decentralization of commercial activity. And this was echoed in, in a few other rural parishes where um, government services and also business services, um, there was a call for them to be closer to them than us having to, and I say us because I'm also from, from a rural parish, having to go to St. George's to do business. Um, build services such as bill payments and financial services. And we know that some of the, the banks have been closing branches in the outer parishes. And that's an issue that came up that um, citizens in those parishes have to have to pay for transportation and so on to be able to do regular day-to-day -day business activity. Also, um, there was a call for the development of tourist attractions in the rural in, in the rural communities as well. And we have a, a, a tendency to centralize the attractions in, in the St. George's area, but there was a call for um, development of heritage sites and other attractions in the rural um, areas that can really bring more business to that part of, of, of the island. Additionally, health services was another area that um, we would like to see developing done in those, in those areas. Thirdly, in terms of um, development and enhancing our, our products and so on, there was a call for more research into what Grenada produces. And in, in terms of down to even the chemical properties of, of, of our cocoa and nutmeg and so on to find out where we have the comparative advantage because it appears that our products, some of our products are superior and they are demanded on the global market and we really are not capitalizing on that. And we're, we're, we're sitting on what could potentially be a, a, really, a real economic boost for Grenada. So there's a call for that. And also incentives for agro-processors to um, enhance the products that, that they produce so that we can move from just primary exports to secondary exports as well. And also new, um, going into new and emerging areas such as gaming and coding and, and, and graphics design and animation, those were expressed by mostly by the youth. In terms of infrastructure overhaul, um, we know that the focus has been on, on roads and bridges and so on for the last few years, but there's also a call for the development of buildings and not just government buildings, but also buildings owned by private individuals. And it was said that um, our towns and our cities, the, the, the buildings are, some of them are in a really terrible state and some of them are derelict. So either the implementation of incentives to um, cause the private owners of those buildings to refurbish and renovate those buildings or, or institute a penalty for having a derelict building. So those were actually suggestions that came out of the consultation to really help give, give our towns a, a facelift. Moving on to citizen empowerment. Three points here, investment, investment in education for youth and adults. And I, I, I stress here adults because whenever we talk about education, we seem to always think about the youth, but there has been a call for more adult literacy programs in our consultations. And um, it may not necessarily be towards a degree, pursuing a degree per se, but it can be short courses where people can get certificates in, in areas that are, are practical, um, such as budgeting, um, customer service, financial management, business management, for, for individuals to improve their own lives. And also, um, if they have a small business, that they're able to manage that business properly. And it's an issue because um, sometimes those small businesses would like to go to a financial institution for, for um, to seek financing for to expand their business. And they do not have the, the records and the skills needed to keep the records in the first place. So that was some of the um, ideas that came out that we need avenues where adults can also pursue um, education in that particular area. Also in terms of education, particularly with youth, the question was asked whether we're equipping our children to thrive in a, in a global world. And in that sense, the call, there was a call for the teaching, the method of teaching to change, not just with the in integration of more technology, because we, we, want to in, in, we want to incorporate more technology in teaching and in learning, but also in terms of the techniques used to, to, to teach. And we need to really te teach our, or equip our teachers to, to teach our students um, using the technology and using those techniques. And the ability to 
if 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 a child isn't isn't learning with a particular technique to switch to another technique. So that was that was some of the the, the suggestions that came out there. Also, um, not just with technical skills and vocational skills, but also soft skills. That's an area that we found that was mentioned that um, we do need to focus on in our education system, soft skills, soft skills such as communication, critical thinking, teamwork, leadership skills, um, so that young people can make a more seamless transition into the work environment. Because even though they have technical skills, some of these soft skills are, are lacking and, and that can actually affect their ability to, to enter into the workforce. Mindset shifts. Now, when we, especially in the youth consultation, we found that some of our youth are, have difficulty dreaming big, as I would say. And it's because of certain limitations that are placed before them. And I think that um, we may be able to, to assist them by removing some of those barriers. For instance, we had conversations about um, whether a youth would like to get involved in, in coding or, or gaming and animation. And the barrier to that would be that there wasn't, they didn't have the connectivity, they didn't have the device. In one case, they didn't have the electricity. So um, if we're going to pursue these areas, first of all, in the short term, we will need to provide the facility to allow that to happen um, so that they have all the infrastructure available at, faci at that facility. And secondary, to, to, uh, as a more long-term plan, to get Grenadians to a point where internet, electricity, and these, these sort of, 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 of things are basic in a, in a particular household, if we are to really be serious about getting into this particular area. The third area, environmental management, um, three points here, mainstream climate, climate resilient considerations, um, waste management, and also renewable energy. So not just uh, mainstreaming climate resilience um, considerations in our major projects, but also in, in our basic everyday life. For instance, just the, um, the way we, the, the, debushing, the debushing program was one that came up. The way that we conducted that program, um, had, there were issues with soil erosion, the way it is done. So that was one of the programs that came up as, as, a, as a one that really should take climate change or climate resilience into consideration. In terms of waste management, um, there was a, there was a, the, the, basically because Grenada has this brand, um, Pure Grenada, and we, it was brought up that Grenada doesn't even recycle. And that is a particular issue that came up in, in several of the consultations. And for us to even get to a point of recycling, we must get to a point of sorting our, our waste. And that was an, an, another idea that came up that we should um, have policies in place that would first allow us to sort the waste, sort the waste, and then we can encourage businesses to get into recycling because the raw material for those businesses is the, the waste that we produce, but it must be um, in a form that they can actually use it. So that was one of the, the um, considerations that were given. Renewable energy, um, this one speaks for itself in terms of solar energy, wind energy, um, geothermal energy, but also with, with biogas. And that's one that um, that technology can be used, especially in the farming industry with our, our livestock farmers, and it could actually help power their, um, their facilities and also for manufacturers and agro-processors as well. So for, for government incentives in these particular technologies so that the, the, the farmers themselves and the agro processes can invest and, and help to reduce our carbon footprint in the, in the, in the long run. The final area on governance and institutional rebuilding, three points here, strengthening, strengthening of the legal system, greater enforcement of, of legislation and policies, and also greater involvement of citizens in the decision-making process. Now we have several ideas coming through here. There was a sense that there's a, a general lag in the court system. So one of the major um, suggestions was to have a small claims court so that individuals that have minor or committed minor offenses can have their matters heard in that, in that court. Um, the, the point was made that a lot of time is wasted going to the court and being told to come back another day and so on. So that was one of the ideas that, that came out of that. And so you have the, the more serious matters being heard in, in the general court. Also stiffer penalties for, for uh, offenses such as sexually, sexually related offenses, especially those relating to, to youth and children was what came up as a suggestion. In terms of the legal framework, as I mentioned before, legal framework with regards to waste management, 
um, was brought up and also incentives for um, our policies to um, encourage the use of renewable energy. Um, pretty Alassany also came up as one. And even though we, we have the legislation now um, that the, the police officers can use, um, there was the comment that when a, a, a fine or a penalty is, is imposed, that the farmer doesn't, in, in most cases, is not adequately compensated for his loss. Some of the some of the um the final speed goes towards the state. So that was a point that was made in um, one of the consultations. The last point um, on greater involvement of citizens in the governance and decision making process. Now, in most of the consultations that we went to, even though the participants were were grateful to meet with the technical the technical officers, they asked for the MPs um, because they really wanted to have some engagement with the policymakers. So um, they, 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 they want their, their, their voices heard by the policymakers themselves, even though we assured them that we would bring, <laughs> we would bring their concerns to the policymakers, they really wanted to meet with them the, um, face to face. So I know, I know the prime minister made a commitment to have town hall meetings. So I just want to, to say here that the people are looking forward to having those with, with you and with the other MPs. So with that, I will, I will end and just say again, thank you um, to everyone who turned out to the consultations and, and hopefully um, next year, um, hopefully earlier next year when we come back, um, you will be able to come back and tell us what we did well and what we need to improve on and what we didn't do and what you still would like to see done. So again, thank you. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Siobhan, for this excellent presentation. And I must say that the uh, feedback from the consultations are quite rich, quite insightful and uh, quite thoughtful. And so we, we are very happy again for everyone who participated in, in, in these uh, consultations, very important. I want to also <clears throat> take this opportunity to thank uh, the staff of the Ministry of Finance, uh, led of course by Siobhan uh, in those consultations. I know that you guys have been traversing the entire country, um, engaging the, the various uh, citizens and so on. So I want to thank you for that. And of course, GIS as well, um, bringing some of those sessions live and, and, and really reaching as many persons as, as, as possible. So thank you again for that. And um, what we'll have at this stage are uh, some uh, short presentations from the various stakeholder group, and we will begin with the with agriculture and fisheries. And I'd like to invite uh, PS Aaron Francois at this stage to make his short presentation. Over to you, PS Francois. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, PS Sylvester, and good evening to everyone. So I would I would share with you. Uh, based on the agriculture consultation that was held on uh, September 21st at the Deluxe Cinema in Grenville. And um, for that consultation, we looked at, at four categories, uh, or four sections of the, of the agriculture, uh, uh, four subsectors. We look at the traditional and non-traditional crops, including beekeepers and floriculture. We also look at the livestock, poultry, butchers subsector. We look at the fisheries, uh, longliners, seamoss producers. And we finally, we look at the group of uh, agro-processors. Um, and so most of uh, the, the persons that were there, um, in fact, I can tell you the Though the, 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 um, that day was a little bit challenging by, uh, in terms of the weather, but we had uh, the persons that came out, we had very robust um, conversation and discussion uh, around those topics. And I would share with you some of, the, uh, some of those things that came out from, that, from those discussion on, on the agriculture sector. First of all, from the traditional and uh, other crop sectors, uh, including the bee and the floriculture. Um, in terms of the group, that group that looked at that, that area, they said that um, for exports, uh, we, we need to strengthen elif for our export uh, crops. Um, and, and they said it in, 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 you know, comparing it to similar to how we we, we, we provide that incentive to tourism. There was that passionate about, we need to address the elif for our, 
our, um, our, our, our crop sector and our agricultural export. Uh, in terms of youth participation, there was some um, a conversation there and, and we said it, the, what came out was that we need to be very strategic in terms of engaging our young people in agriculture. Uh, so we must identify some strategic subsectors where that can attract them and, 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 and encourage them to, to, to go into, such as beekeeping and floriculture. Um, and we must also seek to engage them through a national mentorship program where we can partner more experienced uh, farmers with them to teach them and to help them um, along that journey uh, in, in, in the sector. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, some emphasis uh, was made to the issue of we need to invest more in terms of our forage program. We need to put some more resources there and strengthen our forage program in our schools as, as a youth incentive. Um, in terms of from, from, from the legislative policy point of view for, for the crop uh, sector, um, they said that we need to strengthen legislation uh, in terms of predilacity. Predilacity came out as a major issue and um, uh, Shabon talked earlier about compensation that came out, the fact that um, um, farmers who suffer from pretty larceny are not, are not compensated uh, uh, sufficiently. Um, they, 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 they call on us to focus more on buyers, uh, the, the vendors that are, are vending agricultural produce. We need to put some more focus there and um, strengthen the interface between our police and our extension service. And, and of course, um, they also, the development and enforcement of a land policy came out strongly too. Uh, it was felt that a lot of our land, uh, prime agricultural lands are going into alternative use and, and we need to curb that, that, that trend. And um, pay some emphasis also on buying local, local, local produce. Um, from the, from the um, production side, um, it was emphasized that we need to put some more focus on uh, beekeeping and, and, and as, an, as an incentive or, or as, a, as, a, as a support to agricultural production. As you know, uh, bees help uh, strongly in um, pollination and, and believe that um, beekeeping, while it is a lucrative sector in itself, but it also a very good um, a support for, for agricultural production. Um, they thought that the, the price of inputs, agricultural inputs was, 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 was extremely high and we need to do something there uh, in terms of how do we control the pricing of, of agricultural inputs. Um, they believe that MNIB should play a major role in, 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 the, in the supply of inputs. They should be a main, 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 main um, 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 agent helping to supply agricultural inputs. And um, government should, should have some policy around the issue of um, procurement of, of supplies, agricultural supplies, especially in the institutions, uh, government institutions. Um, in terms of capacity building, we need to train uh, training on critical farming techniques. Um, they believe that there is there is need to 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 help our farmers um, in those skill areas, uh, pruning, drainage, and many of those those techniques that that seem we took we take for granted. But they, we need to put some emphasis there. And in terms of infrastructure, um, the call to attend to farm roads. And, and um, the emphasis here is while, while there are programs that are going on on, on um, building feeder roads, the farmers are saying that we need to look at those farm roads. In other words, those roads that actually go to the farm rather than the main feeder roads. Because uh, it was emphasized that since Hurricane Ivan, some of these roads are, are still impassable and, and farmers are struggling to to, to gain access to the lands. So some emphasis on, on farm roads must, must be shared. Um, 
must be had. Um, in terms of livestock, uh, poultry and butchers, um, uh, in terms of legislation and policy, there was very, very um, strong discussion around the issue of uh, cheaper price for feed and access to feed. Um, there was a lot of discussion around the whole issue of um, ADM, Caribbean Agro, and, and that, 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 that situation there in terms of how can we address, revise, uh, review the agreement and make it be more supportive for, for livestock production on the island. Um, they believe that we need to review the whole livestock policy um, and have stronger policy for livestock development in Grenada. Um, they're not satisfied that they, we have strong enough a, a policy framework for, for livestock development. Uh, in terms of infrastructure for livestock development, they believe that um, we need to pay more attention on proper infrastructure, especially for small scale farmers. Small scale farmers who are going into, for example, livestock and poultry production. There needs to be some emphasis on, on the infrastructure there. And also facilities for slaughtering um, small uh, 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 chicken for small farmers. Um, in terms of fish, fish, fisher folk, longliners, sea moss producers, um, again, uh, the key areas that, that was touched on um, in that area, bait fishery. Um, there, there needs to be some, there's a call for a, a greater legislation around this, this, this fishery, um, especially for the, the size of mesh, because, uh, particularly around the sustainability of, the, of that resource. Um, there needs to be, um, and also there needs to uh, 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 provide a bait in a sustainable manner. Um, also ensuring that we meet the needs of our local consumers. Quality assurance in the fisheries sector. Um, there is a call for the replacement of ice machines. Um, since um, this is a very critical, this is very critical for, for, for uh, uh, ensuring quality in, in the fishery sector. There needs to be, need, be need more training for refrigerant technicians and more available spare parts uh, for, 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 for that area. Uh, and to train our fishers in quality assurance and, and post-harvest in the fishery sector. Again, there is a call for ELIF um, for, for fishery. And, and of course, having um, um, more access to refrigeration trucks uh, for our agro-processors and, and exporters. There were some talks around the conch uh, 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 fishery, the conch uh, lobster, and, and we did, 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 there's a call for uh, uh, better stock assessment to know uh, how we can manage that, 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 that subsector in a more sustainable manner. Um, better data collection and, um, and, and also uh, need to regulate um, some of the, the, the equipment used in, in um, harvesting those, 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 um, those species. Um, in terms of CMOS cultivation, legislation need to protect the cultivation of CMOS. As you know, there have been some activities, there have been some um, um, progress in terms of uh, CMOS production. Are, we have um, increased numbers of, of, of stakeholders going into that, into that sector, but you know, there is, there is the need for legislation there. Um, it seems to be high predator larceny, but also there is on the marketing side, there seems to be some challenges in terms of marketing of the CMOS. And, and finally, the final sector, the agro-processing sector. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the main concerns that was raised around the agro-processing sector is um, where does it fit in the agricultural sector? Uh, and, and I tell you, that, that group was very, very um, um, uh, robust in the, in, the, in the discussion. 
when, when, when they were talking about that, because they don't feel that the agro-processing sector has, has a, a, a strong enough place in the agricultural sector. And um, they say there need to be a strong small manufacturing association to support that sector and to designate uh, an office for concession for agro-processors and also uh, provide a pool of qualified persons who can support the agro-processing sector. And they don't feel that they have enough uh, sufficiently skilled person technicians that, that support and, and give uh, uh, advice and so on to the to the to the agro processing sector, and um, and so um, there was a suggestion to use that we can use uh, farm school um, to assist in training personnel in 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 in, in that area and establish a unit to focus uh, only on on agro processing, and and as you know that 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 is already uh, in the process. Um, in terms of discussions around that has already started. So, um, and to educate agro-processors on the way they can benefit and access support, because the process, the agro-processors believe that there are, there, are, there, are, there are funds available out there that, that, that can support that sector, but somehow they don't have the capacity to, to, to access these, these, um, these, these, these funds that are available to them. Uh, they believe that we should make some a seed, cap, seed fund, capital fund available to set up processing facilities and, and including startup funds for, for, for the use of a technology in the, in the sector. Um, in terms of production for the agro-processing sector, uh, it, 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 there is a call to improve access to packaging material and inputs. And, and improve access to raw materials and storage. Um, because you know the, 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 the fluctuation in supplies, uh, when, 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 the, when the commodity in season, and when it's out of season, um, there is a difficulty in, in, in getting supplies because um, there isn't sufficient storage on, in, in place to, to, to you know, store them when, 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 they, when they come heavy in supply. And, and of course, to increase primary production. Um, there are some commodities where we want to uh, leverage our agro-processing capacity. We need to um, increase the production there. And um, finally, um, um, youth involvement, there is a call, we need to, there, there is a need to pass down the knowledge to our young people. Um, I believe that a lot of people who are involved in agro-processing, sometimes uh, our youths are not, are not connected and, and, and they, don't, they, they do not um, uh, have access to that knowledge sufficiently. So there is need to pass on that knowledge to them. And, and so um, in terms of the infrastructure, equip our labs uh, to provide quality control and other lab services, uh, for example, nutritional fact, especially to support export of our agro-processed products. And um, finally, on the policy side, the need for quality standards and a mark for locally produced products. Uh, just like how we have out of Jamaica, you have Grace and Grace have the mark and you can identify it any, on any shelf, supermarket shelf. They believe that we must have a mark, uh, a unique mark for our Grenadian agri, agri, agri products. And, um, and, and we must have some quality standards that, that to, to to help sustain the development of that sector. And so that's it for, for the agriculture a component. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much, P.S. Francois, uh, for your excellent presentation. And of course, for highlighting uh, some of the key feedback from the agriculture and fishery sector. We want to now turn to uh, youth and we'll have a presentation from P.S. Norman Gilbert, I just want to uh, give us a little reminder about the, the time. You want to stick to 10 minutes for the presentation so that we can have all the presentation within the time period allotted. So over to you, P.S. Yes, thank you very much, uh, P.S., for your invitation. Uh, let me say a special good evening to Honorable Prime Minister, uh, members of, of Parliament, uh, colleague PSCs, 
senior officials, Ministry of Finance staff. I'm going to try to present a synopsis of the youth consultation, along with the consultation on sports, which I want to commend the Ministry of Finance on, because I understand it's the first time that we're having a consultation that really focused directly on the issue of sports. Um, and it was very welcome. In fact, the stakeholder grouping that were engaged in the sports uh, meeting expressed their satisfaction um, with being given an opportunity to air their opinion. And so I would present a summary of the discussions that we would have had in regards to sports to commence. Um, there were many issues that were raised during that deliberation um, with the various sporting sectors and sporting enthusiasts. I believe that it is essential that we focus on the summary of the conversation. The Sports for All program is something that the participants felt was critical for the advancement of sport and the transformation of the sport agenda. And not only should we focus on sport for students and athletes who are in school, but also to see sport as an essential pillar in terms of the health and wellness. And I believe that the participants were suggesting that government should focus on the implementation of some project that can have uh, persons of all age, as was said in the discussion, from the cradle to the grave, involved directly in, in, in sport. The other issue is the implementation of a national sports policy and recreation policy. Um, members felt that it, uh, it is a critical juncture for the, for the implementation of such a, of a policy. Um, they also would have raised issues that the policy would speak to. For example, the rewards for athletes and coaches. They also spoke about the need to have community uh, sporting events and to have sport organized at the community level. They spoke about the management of our sporting facilities and the upkeep of those facilities and the need to strengthen um, sporting clubs and groups and organizations, all of which uh, they believe are critical aspects of the sports policy and that government's transformational agenda should focus immediately with the support of this budget for full implementation of aspects of the national sports policy. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on the sporting facilities and upgrade to sporting facilities. The, the participants spoke about the need to improve the, the major sporting facilities. They, they spoke about the work that has to be done in the National Cricket Stadium. They spoke about also the parish fields and the need for proper maintenance of those facilities, um, including our basketball courts, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the persons also mentioned the need for a proper indoor facility which can support multiple sport and that some focus should be made in this budget to look at ensuring a government move towards uh, having an indoor facility that can support the sports of basketball, volleyball, netball, um, that can have the impact in terms of the sports tourism. Um, many mentioned that there are a number of international teams, regional teams that can be hosted within this a sporting facility if government can so um, ensure that that facility is constructed. Um, the capacity building for coaches, it came out quite clearly that we cannot focus on the improvement of athletes, though we have the athletes who would have excelled, the, you know, the Kirani James, et cetera, the Lyndon Victor and so forth. Um, they spoke about having coaches that can actually support the athletes development and that we have a number of coaches who have been coaching for a very long time who are not certified, though they understand the practice, and that we need to build the capacity of our local coaches, especially within the ministry, to support the development programs. And also at the association level, because there was also a lot of discussion about the role of sporting associations that can help to enhance the delivery of developmental aspects of the sport. And therefore, they would have recommended that the budget also seeks to focus on capacity building for our local coaches, whether locally or even through scholarships abroad to improve the capacity of these coaches. Again, a critical area that came out of the conversation is that of sports medicine and physiotherapy. Um, recognition was also given to the current operation of the physiotherapy unit at the National Stadium within the Ministry of Sports. 
but of course there is need for expansion. Currently, we only have one physiotherapist and a team of, uh, of, of support staff that supports all associations and traveling teams, national traveling teams, whenever there is a need for medical or physiotherapy services. And that is an area that is very limited. Um, we have not been really focusing on that aspect of the sport development. And so the, the discussions around the need for us to place emphasis on providing opportunities for expanding the physiotherapy units, or also opportunities for scholarship um, in the area of sports medicine and physiotherapy. Uh, in terms of culture, in regards to culture, and the cultural aspect came out in the, the National Youth Consultation that was held at the Youth Center. In fact, we would have had just over 150 young people who would have gathered to give their feedback in terms of what they would like to see going forward. A lot of which have already been mentioned by Ms. by um, Siobhan in her presentation. And so I'll just try to, to put a, a summary in terms of that conversation. In regard to culture, um, it came up quite clearly that there is a need for a center for the performing arts. We understand that the work has started uh, already in terms of the Simon Cultural Center. Um, participants spoke about uh, a need to have a space where they can practice the craft, where they can have developmental parts of the, of the craft in terms of culture, performing arts, dance, theater, um, music, song, drama, et cetera. And so there, there was a call to ensure that we look at the Simon Cultural Center as a critical aspect of the budget um, for the upcoming cycle and that we would have some allocation that will help to advance the work that has already started on the Simon Control Center. We also have the music labs. Um, currently, there are two established music labs, one at SAST and one at McDonald's College. And participants spoke about the need to ensure that these music labs provide services not only to the students, but also to people in the community who are interested in recording, learning to play different musical instruments and so on. Um, Critical, again, they would have spoken about the need for the creative industry to be seen as a viable means of job creation and not just for us to create songs for carnival um, as the case might be, and that we need to ensure that our creative industry is really harnessed. There are a lot of potential that exists um, with filmmakers, actors, promoters, artists, musicians, that we can ensure that it provides a, a critical aspect for job creation. And so the meeting also focus on the need for government to make investment in the creative industry, um, especially in the film and music industry to support the development of artists and actors, promoters in that regard. Um, in the area of, of youth specifically, now there were a, a long list of recommendations that were put forward by the young people who would have gathered. In the interest of time, I will just try to create a synopsis of the top five that I believe were critical based on the conversation um, that we would have had. As I said before, it was a long, exhaustive, non-exhaustive list of, of activities that they would have recommended um, for government consideration. But I believe that the, the issue of providing training and employment opportunities for youth came out quite clearly. Um, there was a call for for a relook at the Imani program to ensure that it provides for more job readiness skills and to ensure that young people can benefit in terms of the provision of uh, apprenticeship type training, but also to move into the issue of employment. And um, there was a call for programs to be created at the community level as well that would provide opportunities for young people to receive training in their localized jurisdictions. Um, the issue of providing enterprise training, entrepreneurship came out quite a lot. Uh, I, I was I was very enthused yes, by. Yes, the, I don't I don't want sorry I don't want to cut you but we need to we need to speed it up a little bit because we we really gonna yes, run out of time. Certainly. Right? This is this is my last slide. Um, the issue of uh, supporting uh, small businesses. Um, they also would have mentioned a regular consultation to be held with young people and to incorporate life skills into the education system as mentioned before by Siobhan. And finally, the development of the cannabis industry, which they believe it would also help to advance their cause. So this is a summary of the of the presentation, and I, I thank you for having the opportunity to present it. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move right into the next presentation. I'd like to invite the 
uh, Mr. Rahman, private sector representative, to present. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Protocol already established. A pleasant good evening to all. I'll jump right in. Uh, we would like to, to see that the program, uh, that the GDP, Green and Development and Bank, has for currently has and has had for a while for MSMEs, micro, small, and medium enterprises, be continued. And that is 1% concessionary financing with a maximum of $300,000 um, as a borrowing limit. Um, we would like to see that continue because the alternative to that is usually um, private financing and at seven plus percent on, on, on the market. And so we recognize that for small and micro businesses, for them to start just like a plant, uh, it needs propping, it needs assistance. Um, and so I move right into the next point that follows that. Next point is national mentorship program. It was mentioned, but it, it needs to be mentioned more than once. Um, we need funding for a national mentorship program. We have many qualified and experienced retirees. Uh, we need to make use of them for specific uh, training and areas of certification, areas of which certification is required. For example, skilled carpentry. We have a situation where um, you have um, carpenters or so coming out of uh, um, Camp CC, New Low, and they might get a job or two, and then all of a sudden they're driving a truck with a contractor written on the top of it. And we don't know at what level of skill they can, they can, uh, they can deliver. And, you know, we, we want to be able to hire uh, skilled people according to certification so that we know when we hire somebody to sheet rock, that person is not learning on the job. Um, so uh, machine technicians, the private sector, we have a lot of machines that are purchased and they, you know, something, a board blows in the machine or something happens. Um, and you see that even in, in government and there are not enough technicians, machine technicians to go in there, diagnose what the problem is, uh, get the parts, fix them. Uh, we oftentimes have to buy new machines. Uh, public speaking, understanding financial statements, all of that on the mentorship, uh, you know, for small and micro businesses that usually don't have a board of directors. So the, the national mentorship program will assist them in making the right decisions in their business so that when that 1% loan is given, their business can succeed. The absence of that, they, they, they shoot in the dark. On to the next point. Uh, regarding ease of doing business in Canada, we call for a node uh, or a point of connection for bilateral cooperation between the government and the private sector. So, you know, we, we need to make sure that there is a go-to department um, that will help the private sector communicate effectively across government. So they can direct us where to go and it, it, it will be easy and not, and not, you know, you have to call this person and then you call that person and that person is not in so on. One department where we can call interface with them, um, uh, communicate effectively across the departments. Moving on, traffic congestion. Traffic impacts productivity across the nation negatively. And um, we wanna improve or widen road networks where necessary, uh, you know, especially where there are, of course, bottlenecks and hindrances to the flow of traffic. Sometimes the bottleneck is not only due to the road, but an obstacle nearby the road or, or around the corner or in the road. Um, so such as improper parking and so forth. Uh, a suggestion, for example, Sugar Mill Roundabout, uh, leading up to Sugar Mill Roundabout, the, the traffic has automatically made two lanes. But on the roundabout itself, we have one lane. And when you travel to Trinidad or Barbados and so on, you see that there are roundabouts that have two lanes that work seamless. So that's the normal world is wide. That's a no-brainer. I think we could work on these um, points of congestion and try to alleviate uh, for productivity gains. Um, next point, government efficiency. Um, companies should be able to submit financial statements online in line review. Forms for tax compliance. 
and to be available online. I know it's sent in the mail, but that's a waste of paper. And many times you get a duplication of it or you don't get it at all. And so if you have it online, um, then the taxpayer can print it and maybe a notice can go out, tell the taxpayer when this is due or that is due. Um, next point is widen the tax net. Uh, as you bring businesses into the formal business sector, provide training and consultation with regard to tax requirements to help them to understand how to comply. What is required of me? You know, you often hear taxpayers say, I didn't know, I didn't know. And then interest and penalties have been added up for a year. And, and, and then you, you wonder why they try to dock and bob and weave because they don't understand what is required. Required of them, and they need to, there needs to be more engagement. So that that node or that point of connection can assist in that regard as well. Um, perk, there seems to be a bottleneck. Perk, um, it's what I've heard. Let's consult on this issue to solve it. Do what's necessary to process the many stalled applications made by the private sector. Uh, from listening to business people, the core issue with perk is the return on investment. Any investment that is made, people want to know that they have a, 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 a decent return on investment. So it must be beneficial for all concerned. So let's find that sweet spot, as they say, uh, through consultation. Um, other point is the upliftment of, of a, a hand up out of poverty. Electrical costs, um, reoccurring costs monthly is significant to the poor. And if we can have a pilot project of let's say a hundred or hundred low income homes, so I'll fit them with a grid tie solar system that will zero their electricity bill automatically. So automatically they pay no electricity, but they pay back the government over a period of 10 years, an average solar panel system will last 15 years probably. So they pay back government over a period of 10 years, eight years for the system, and with a, with a little profit for government so that they can continue to expand the program. Um, and, 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 and then after they pay it back, it, it's a means of income for the family. So you turn a debt, which is an electrical expense for the most vulnerable in your society, the means of income for them after they pay off government for that debt. And you could start with maybe 100 homes, um, uh, low income homes. And that might cost you around three to $4 million based on my, uh, final point is lawyer overheads. It is not in the long-term interest of government to continue to rent um, new offices and, and, and places as government uh, needs to shift and move and expand and so on. So one way for growth is to do is to earn more income. Another way is to control and to lower your expenses. And um, the government needs to budget for repurchasing properties or purchasing properties. Um, and so they can offer something when they have, when we, when we have uh, public-private partnerships. They can offer the land, for example. And also they will have, they don't have to spend a lot of their, uh, so much money in terms of rent. So acquiring new property, we see that NIS has done a good job of that. And uh, perhaps government needs to do that as well because we want a government that is you know, um, efficient and that's, that, that, that uses their money for programs to help the economy grow and not necessarily to pay rent. And I think that's it for my contribution. Um, we have much more that we have emailed to you um, today. And so I'd like you to have a look at it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rowan, and um, for your uh, presentation. And I think you cited uh, several very important uh, points. We want to move right along. So at this stage, we will have a presentation from the civil society organization. And I would like to invite Ms. Chris Davis at this point to make our presentation. Thank you, Pierce Sylvester. 
Good evening, everybody. I'm, yeah, as, as Mr. Sylvester said, I'm, represent, I'm presenting on behalf of the organization of the grouping of civil society organizations. And we thank the administration to the Ministry of Finance for this opportunity. And as we offer these recommendations, suggestions and ideas, we're being mindful of the significant economic and financial challenges experienced by Grenada and its citizens, and the ultimate cost to be borne by taxpayers in the financing of the country's budget and repayment of, of loans contracted. I'm mindful of the responsibility as perceived by government to provide safety nets and opportunities for citizens. Other issues we're mindful of, value for money, particularly of capital expenditure, sustainability and long-term viability of some initiatives, for example, the new money program, and the environmental impact and resultant intensification of disaster risks and vulnerabilities caused by certain activities. And I'm really glad that Siobhan was mentioning earlier that the debushing program has been mentioned several times. So the following are comments and recommendations offered in response to the meeting hosted by the Ministry of Finance on September the 19th, and is based on the presentation by the Budget Division, the Throne Speech and the NDC Manifesto. Noting the five overarching pillars articulated in the manifesto and repeated in the, throne, in the throne speech. What we also wanted to note at this point was that these reference documents did not specially reference children, women, the disabled, nor the aged. Okay, our recommendations. One was about the health services. And on this note, we emphasize the a focus on primary and preventative health care at community level, and particularly what we feel has been neglected, which is the delivery of mental health and psychosocial services. And these need to be integrated into primary health care and could address issues such as conflict resolution, anger management, issues of violence in general, and violence against women. We were wondering, as nurses are the bastion of the primary healthcare services, what is the status of the nursing programme? Is it now integrated into SGU? And what is the status of nurses graduated from this programme? Given the burden of non-communicable diseases faced by Grenada, educating our young people about nutrition is of the utmost importance. And hopefully this is going to be led by the Food and Nutrition Council through, through schools and communities. We were also wondering if um, NGOs, NSAs, CSOs could be enabled to deliver certain health services at the community level. Climate change adaptation and mitigation. This is a real bugbear for everybody, you know, globally at the moment, but very important in Grenada. And it needs to be mainstreamed into all sectors. Climate change, well, I know we, we, we talk about climate um, resilience here, but for me, it feels like it then becomes a sort of our, our fault, our responsibility, where, whereas I find climate change isn't something that we instigated. It's coming from another source for the most part, even though we contribute to it, but you know, climate change is affecting everybody's health, and the response of the health of the health sector has to be considered. You know, we've dealt with chikungunya and with Zika very successfully, and this year it's been heat both inside and outside. So therefore, um, green spaces, green spaces and trees, more trees, stopping cutting down trees, absolutely vital because it's been shown in research and in, several, in several ways that you know, a, a street or an area that has lots of trees usually has a three to four degrees lower temperature than, than a place which has been denuded of trees. So trees, trees and more trees. And we think that planting of trees has to be factored into any development. And if trees are being cut down or taken away, they need to be replanted immediately or put into a nursery so they can be replaced. This should be, this should be a part of every single development that happens. 
along with adequate sidewalks. You know, I, I, live, in, I live just outside Soteres and it's quite scary to walk along Soteres High Street sometimes because the buses and the vehicles and they're passing within inches of you because we have to walk in the road for the most part. There are a few sidewalks, but most of the time you're walking in the drains. So that has to be taken as a consideration when you're, when, when we're talking about development. Environmental management. The Ministry of Environment must be enabled by the passing of legislation, which has been sitting in draft for years. And not only the Environmental Management Act, but the Coastal Zone Management Act, the newly written Natural Resources Act, and other relevant pieces of legislation and policies like the land use policy. They all need regulations and the will to implement them in order to protect our environment and its ecosystems. We only have one planet, we have to act now. Therefore, an urgent need to upgrade the human resources capacity of these ministries and departments is vital and includes places like the physical planning unit, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestries, Fisheries, they all need um, the technical skills, the, the human capacity and the physical capacity to carry out their work. Environmental impact assessments, these have to be made mandatory for all development projects as the effects of climate change must be mainstreamed into the design and implementation of all public service implementation, implementation projects including roads and bridges. And the building codes have to be reviewed, again, along the lines of building climate resilience as an issue, again, I want to repeat, the issue of heat must be considered. You know, mainstreaming climate change and climate resilience has to be, has to, has to be vital at this point in time. Again, I'm glad that um, Siobhan mentioned the debushing program because the, the implementation of the program has to change. We've been lobbying for years, for years and years about the, about the debushing program being environmentally disastrous. There has to be training of supervisors who will oversee the workers and manage the projects in an eco-friendly way. And given that the program is a safety net, there should be an exit strategy for persons on the program. And I think we've already, well, I know we've already sent recommendations and we made those in the 20, 2016 budget process by the grouping of CSOs in respect to the debushing program. And one example of the recommendations was that a team could be employed all year round as a maintenance team for roads and the roadsides. And at this point, the other recommendations also remain relevant. Sports for all. Reference to be made to professionalization of athletes and those representatives and national teams. And I'm glad Mr. Gilbert was saying that this has been a, a strong talking point in the, in the consultations. The important starting point for us would be sports for all to be implemented at school and community level. And to ensure that provisions are made for, for persons with different abilities, including older people. Because you know, we all know that um, participation in sports makes for healthier people, good health, social skills, for example, discipline, teamwork, conflict resolution. It is, and it also contributes to enhanced health, the productivity, you know, less days off for sick from work or school, caring for sick people in the community, visits to hospitals, less money on income spent on medication. So it's a win-win for everybody. The Imani program, again, recommendations are made to the 2016 budget process. And so the, those recommendations we feel remain relevant to this day. And you will have, a, you already have a copy of them. Justice and the legal system. Um, well, we all know what's been happening in the past couple of weeks and it's alarming to say the least. So among the recurring problems we feel are the physical and human resources of that, of that ministry. Therefore it's urgent. And I, I was pleased to hear um, Minister Senator Joseph talking about 
that some change is already happening with um, physical and human resources. And we just want to reiterate that, that the equipment and facilities be brought up to date along with suitably qualified staffing, along with the issue of security being addressed, security of records needs to be urgently addressed, but cannot mean the absence of transparency and accountability. The public who wish to access these things must be able to record, must be able to do so. Last but not least, citizen empowerment. Except for the commitment to local government in Karakumpa's Papati Martinique, there are no other commitments or provisions made for other constituencies or parishes. Are there going to be any other kind of councils, local councils, local, local government? I know it's not um, incorporated in the, in the constitution, but can we at least look at what might happen to other constituencies and parishes? Because me mechanisms for social dialogue and consensus building contributes significantly to citizen engagement, participation and empowerment. And in the 2013-14 year, key social partners like private sector, labor, faith-based organizations. Uh, these, uh, I think we're gonna wrap up in a, in a, a few seconds. Yeah, yes. one minute. Civil society, you know, the, and the government of Grenada negotiated a comprehensive social compact, which focused on the goal of people-centered sustainable development, embracing people, planet, and profit. So the possibility, although at the time it felt like there wasn't a commitment. So the possibilities of social compact were not realized given the lack of commitments. So if one of these social compacts was implemented with integrity and commitment, it would be of immense benefit. But first it would be need to be reviewed and adjustments made. And just one more point on a personal level, I'm sincerely hoping that on behalf of um, the people of Mount Craven and Mount Rodney, that something that the priority in St. Patrick will be something to be done about the loss of the beaches due to the breakwater, the wall, whatever you wish to call it. Thank you, P.S. Celeste. Thank, thank you very much uh, for, your, for your presentation. Um, we noted some very useful points. I don't know if you can send the Imani, the recommendation on the Imani program and the, and the um, the motion, sorry, that you'd have mentioned uh, for us again. I know you said we have, we have it from the 2016 consultations. Moving right along, if we can um, have yeah. a presentation from the Trade Unions Council, and we'll invite Mr. Bert Patterson to present. Again, we want you to pay attention to the time. I think we have gone over quite significantly. So over to you. Okay, good night, everyone. Um, and I would like to thank the Minister of Finance, Prime Minister, and his team for this most useful engagement and hope that unlike in the past, um, at least some of the items that are brought forward um, may be taken on and worked on. Um, I should be able to stay in my 10 minute time gap. Um, so for several budget cycles, the GTUC has indicated at similar consultations, it's disappointment that the budgets of the past have not considered as a major initiative transforming Grenada from an import retail economy to one based on local production of goods and services. It has been our stated position, which we publish as the GTUC charter um, that is normally circulated pre and post all elections over the past two or so dec decades. It is a fact that the government's largest source of income is from border taxes, import duties and the like. And the largest economic activity on the island is from import, wholesale and retail operations. This we think is not the best option for transforming Grenada's economy. It may be the most secure source of funds for the government and the most profitable income generator for the private sector. But the fact that possibly as much as between 80 and 90% of all consumer goods come from imports to include items that can be produced in Grenada, that cannot be the best option for economic advancement. Food security, 
full employment of the working population and balance of trade issues. Although hardly ever mentioned in budget discussions, balance of trade is really the, our biggest problem. It is noted that several local manufacturers have indicated to us um, the jobs of our members are threatened through competition that is unfair to them when competing with important goods as concessions do not give them the advantage, especially with important goods from the region. We also understand the realities of economy of scale and we are one of the smallest, but it still is a big threat to them that should be addressed. The fact that as much money as possible leaves the state, right? And that is plenty more than that that comes in from our exports and production is a vicious cycle that unless change will always have the state in economic stagnation or regression. Um, minimum wage and inflation matters. A sure sign of regression is the fact that over the last 22 years, there have been only two adjustments made to the national minimum wage. One in 2001 and the last in 2009, 13 years ago. One must consider that every year during those years, there would have been inflation. In some years, as much as 8% by official figures and most probably much more when one considers the items that low income earners spend their money on. There could be no question that persons earning the minimum wage got a lot poorer than they were in 2001. When one considers the rate of inflation and the stagnation of their wages, although this is not a matter that may have a major bearing on the budget, which we are discussing um, now, because it is assumed that most workers in the public sector are paid above the minimum wage. But it is a matter that must be addressed by the administration as it has bearing on the spending power of citizens and therefore will have great impact on, the, on poverty reduction, the health of the nation and the economy directly. We call on the administration to immediately commence the setting, the starting of the wage advisory meetings. I believe the board has been appointed and institute the recommendations of that board as soon as um, probably January of the new year. We know, know um, time is an issue, but because of this 13-year um, lull, we think it's absolutely necessary that this be done as a matter of urgency. Incidentally, it is noted that laws enacted during the IMF structural adjustment program that we went through, I think from 2014, are still on the books. Th those laws sought to restrict the freedom of unions to negotiate with the public sector through the restrictions involving growth. Um, labor have always objected to those regulations and we still do as they make no reference to inflation, government income, surpluses and government spending on non-essential areas. The new administration has said during the campaign for elections that the matter of precarious employment will be addressed in the public service. We in labor are impatiently waiting um, action in this area. And sadly, the leader and worst offender in this field has been in fact the government of Grenada who has set such a bad example that the private sector is quickly catching up to the bad example. We cannot fail to mention that most cases of contract, casual, temporary, and those sorts of labor arrangements engaged by the, in the private and public sector are all direct breaches of section 29.5 of the Employment Act. It is not complicated. All we ask is that employers, private and public sector abide by the laws of Grenada and the Ministry of Labor should assist in enforcing these. There can be no talk of productivity, transformational agenda, 24 hour workday, um, customer service, tourism readiness, 
without the matter of public transportation being addressed. First off, with a minimum wage in some categories as low as $35 per day, a worker in Paraclete, St. Andrew, must pay around $28 to travel less than 20 miles to get to work at one of the five-star hotels in the south of the island. That leaves take-home pay of around $7. You do the math and advise that worker if that job is worth taking and if it is worth him leaving home for. Secondly, after dark, there's absolutely no public transportation available to all areas of the island, except possibly Granans. I won't say the South, possibly Granans. We cannot even consider talking about transformation if this matter is not addressed. We are aware that the transportation board exists and that has existed for many years, but they have solved no problems as far as I know since the eighties. Um, although politicians do not give up authority easily, it may be necessary to change the constitution of the board. I would say among other boards, given ministerial domination or given up ministerial domination and make the authority autonomous and multipartite in its constitution to include representation from the users, the operators, commerce, labor, NGOs, and government. This may allow the board to make tough decisions without the fear of political ramifications by upsetting the operators or someone which the politicians would normally want to satisfy. Yeah. Um, we in Labour have found it unfair that only we, the monthly, fortnight, and weekly wage earners, pay our full taxes. No wage earners can become millionaires on the wages we get. Um, based on the lifestyles observed, we have a lot of millionaires in the state now. Um, many in recent times have found good fortune in the professional fields, political association, entrepreneurial endeavors, which is all good um, and are obviously making huge amounts of income. But very few pay their fair taxes. I can quote at least three Minister of Finances of the past or Ministers of Finance of the past um, that have stated, it is not that we don't have enough taxes. The problem is that we don't collect them. We have been told that among some professionals in lucrative sectors, compliance has in the past been less than 10%. There has been a recent, there has been in, rec in recent memory, only one effort to correct a major act of tax evasion involving a local supermarket owner. And it was such a rare occurrence. Um, it is sad, but we cannot help speculate that the matter was more than just about taxes. That may be cynical, but it is the case. Mm -hmm. um, to quote one senior public officer, the Inland Revenue Department has been decimated. Simply do your work, of collecting from the evaders who vex vex, and there will be enough financing for the transformational agenda. It should be a necessary and it should be a necessity and obligation of the government with a transformational agenda to rebuild our institutions, most of which have been damaged, degraded, or assaulted at some time since 1967. The older folks here would know and understand the significance of that date. We look forward to the budget setting a course for the improvement of the nation's finances as a whole and the workers' lot in particular. And I must state, having been participating in some of these activities in the past, I must repeat that all the good things that come out of these um, activities have most times not found their way into the budget when read and when administers. We're looking for a difference now. And thank you very much again to the Prime Minister and his team for giving us this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patterson, uh, <clears throat> for your uh, presentation. We will move swiftly into the next presentation.
from the uh, tourism sector, and we'll ask uh, Mr. Ross Fielding to present at this time. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for having us and allowing us to, uh, to make our presentation. I'd first like to um, congratulate the Prime Minister on his um, speech at United Nations, which devoted uh, a percentage of it to climate change, which is I want, I, what I want to focus on as well today. I'd also like to say uh, congratulations to Siobhan for an excellent uh, startup um, presentation. Um, <clears throat> one thing that everybody has been mentioning throughout the um, presentations is uh, they're looking for ways of, um, of, of getting additional funding from government, um, probably possibly with the exception of BERT. Um, but one issue that we must address urgently is that of the cost of electricity. Because without energy, without power, we haven't got a future. There is no future economy. We are reliant on foreign imported oil to provide us with energy. Um, <clears throat> and it's expensive right now, it's incredibly expensive. Our own electricity bill here at uh, True Blue Bay Resort has, uh, has gone up by 95% in the last two months. It's unsustainable. And yet here we are in a country that's got ample sun, ample wind. And um, uh, we, must, we must dedicate some serious, serious capital funding towards putting some wind and solar um, energy systems into the country so that we can uh, produce our own energy and, um, and, and not re be reliant on Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia or whoever else is providing us with, uh, with energy. So we cannot, we will not be able to move forward until we develop a system in our very, um, uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our country without uh, ge generating um, our own our own electricity. Um, and that being said, I would like to uh, uh, suggest <clears throat> that one of the ways forward is to make sure that we have plenty of incentives by the government so that we can uh, get the private sector deeply involved into, the, um, uh, into this arena. Uh, we, need to be, be put, we need to be putting solar panels on every single roof on the island, every household, every business, all these big roofs you can see around the, uh, government buildings, schools, Everything else all should be covered in solar panels. Um, wind energy, wind generators are now incredibly cheap compared with what they were five, 10 years ago. Uh, you, can, you can buy a one megawatt uh, generator for about $2 million, $3 million. Um, and uh, uh, we, we don't need a great number of these to, uh, to supply the whole country with, with uh, electricity. And that leads me on to the next thing. If we, if we build more um, windmills and solar panels than what we actually need. We can generate um, uh, green hydrogen. Uh, we haven't even looked at that yet. <clears throat> green hydrogen is, a, uh, is very expensive to produce if you're using normal electricity, but if you're using uh, uh, solar and wind uh, electricity, then it becomes viable. And, gen and uh, uh, green hydrogen is what we can use to power trucks um, and buses, particularly buses. And so um, we, we need to put some emphasis on, um, on the generation of, uh, of electricity. So we become independent. We need to become an independent nation. Um, <clears throat> and you may wonder what's this got to do with, uh, with the tourism sector? It's got everything to do with it because we continue paying these high, high energy costs. We are not gonna be able to be sustainable. We're not gonna be competitive um, regionally and internationally. So, uh, it is critical we move forward as fast as fast as possible to uh, to get our, um, our energy systems uh, um, up to speed. Um, in terms of tourism, um, I've, somebody mentioned the uh, the the, the, the uh, waste reduction. Um, the tourism is uh, and the, and the tourism sector is ready and willing to start sorting waste. If if there's a system in place where the waste goes to uh, uh, to a separate to separate uh, places at Perseverance, we will do it immediately. We've got we've put the systems in place. We had it in place before COVID. We will do it straight away. Um, Chris mentioned um, uh, uh, clearing forests. This has got to stop. Um, everybody who do, who wants to build a house, the first thing they do is they chop down all the trees on the site and flatten it. 
it really has to stop. Trees are critical, critical for the absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They're, they're critical for keeping the temperatures down. And like Chris said, you know, it reduces your temperatures by about uh, uh, two degrees straight off. And that's critical in these, ever, in these days of ever um, increasing um, heat, which we've seen, seen a lot of in the last few days. Um, one of, the, one of the things with uh, the tourism sector is that we are an export industry. Um, and it must be, you know, must be recognized that we are probably the biggest export industry on the island. Um, and I include SGU as a, as a, as a tourism, it's educational tourism. Um, so we have to find ways of improving and increasing our revenues at the hotels, especially considering the uh, increased cost of electricity. Um, and uh, so we have to stimulate the, uh, uh, the hotel sector, the restaurants, the small, the small guest houses, the Airbnbs to, uh, to, uh, to bring in, to improve their properties, to, in, to improve their, uh, 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 their revenues so that we can um, uh, generate more VAT and more taxes that are spent locally. Remember that everybody who comes, every tourist that comes into the country is bringing in foreign um, uh, dollars. And um, so we need to look very closely at um, the, so the reduction on duties uh, for, for equipment and uh, for, uh, for uh, bits and pieces that the hotels use. Um, one other issue that uh, we need to really focus on, uh, we spoke to the um, agriculture sector spoke earlier on, um, tourism and agriculture must develop in parallel. It is absolutely no point in, big, in, in building large hotels and then only to have to import all of the food and, and goods that they need to provide to their guests. So we need to be able to have an agricultural sector that can provide maybe not all, but a certainly a vast um, percentage of our, uh, of, of our needs for the, for the tourism sector. Um, <clears throat> staff retention has become a real problem over in the last, um, uh, well, since COVID. Um, last six months has been really difficult staff are moving from one hotel to the next, to one restaurant to the next. Um, we need to, uh, I, I go along with Bert. We, we've, we've really got to ensure that uh, we have a stability in the labor force and the st stability in the labor force is brought on by decent wages. <coughs> and we get decent wages if we can get decent revenues into the businesses. Um, I think uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, earlier on, I, I forget who, about the reno about buildings, old buildings in, in town. We have a, a most amazing asset in St. George's, some beautiful old buildings that are now disintegrating and falling to pieces. Some of them have literally got maybe two or three years left to survive and then the roofs will collapse. And I say this with feeling we, we have a business right next door to the museum. The museum has been closed for what, two years now um, and doesn't show any signs of opening. The roof on, on that building is in a terrible state. It's deteriorating rapidly. Um, unless our buildings, the government buildings are maintained we will lose a, a really important heritage for our, uh, for our tourism sector and for our country. So I beg government to find ways of, um, of uh, stimulating the private sector to invest in some of those buildings. Um, and it's possible. Um, uh, we personally at the House of Chocolate have, uh, have just recently uh, shored up one wall at our cost, not at government cost, at our cost because we understand the, the importance of making sure that these buildings are, um, are, are preserved. Um, <clears throat> and I wanna back up uh, two or three people have talked about the public transport. The public transport is abysmal at the moment. We have to do something very serious about getting our public transport sorted out because exactly like Bert said, if somebody is coming from St. Patrick's down to the, the south of the island, they're spending more on buses or as much on buses as what they earn during the day. And it just doesn't make sense. And a lot of the excellent employees come from the north. If, they are, um, they're, if they're gonna have a job down here, they try and look for some cheap accommodation, which is not available. So they end up squatting somewhere. So please, 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 let's get our public bus system sorted out so that uh, 
Um, staff can get home at night. Uh, as Bert said, after, after dark, the buses stop. It's ridiculous. Um, it, it, we have to be able to provide a service so the buses, so our staff can get home um, uh, and safely and at a reasonable uh, fee as well. Um, finally, let's talk about, I've got a couple more things. Uh, regional flights and ferries to uh, carry coup. Um, our, the regional business has taken a real uh, nosedive. It is a very important uh, part of our tourism sector. It's also a very important part of trade between the islands. If we can't trade with our neighbors, and we have to trade with the United States or Great Britain or wherever else, uh, it doesn't make sense. We have, we have local markets where we can send our produce to. Um, and, but without a decent ferry system, without a decent uh, regional um, airline system, that's not going to happen. And it's, that's an, another area where we can develop business and develop um, uh, income for the country. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so, so Philip, just, just um, one minute more. So you just, you can oh, have... certainly, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm very happy that you followed my suggestion, uh, 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 Mike. Um, <coughs> just uh, two more items. Um, <coughs> it is, <coughs> excuse me, um, opening bank accounts for, for, for the staff is just about impossible these days. Uh, please, can somebody do something about getting the getting it easier to open a bank account? It is it is just about uh, impossible. So you end up with lines and lines of people at the bank cashing checks, um, and especially as banks are closing uh, their their uh, uh, offices around the uh, around the country and the other other centres, Guam and Sotes and Grenville, it makes no sense. So we need to have decent banking system put in place. And finally. Um, I think um, Siobhan uh, said greater involvement by the ministers. Um, it took us nearly eight weeks to get a meeting with the Minister of Tourism. I have been pleading with the Minister of Environment to have a meeting with us to talk about environmental issues. I have failed on both counts. So I throw down the gauntlet right now. Please call us up, make meetings, let's talk regularly. It's very important that we, uh, we communicate properly. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, give our our views and uh, and good luck with the rest of the meeting. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Russ. Uh, we're moving right along. The next presentation from the banking uh, sector. We have it from the president, Mr. Larry. <laughs> Perfect timing. Good segue. Great, great. Yes, uh, thank good you, thank time. you all. Uh, yes. Protocol having been established, uh, I will present the cliff notes from the banking sector for the budget consultation. The top priorities are four main areas. Uh, the first area being digitization. Uh, the uh, second area being regulatory enhancement, climate change and cybersecurity. So for digitization is really about modernizing the technological infrastructure backbone, you know, which of course digitization being converting information into a digital format, the core banking systems uh, need to be technologically enhanced uh, to facilitate the digitization. Yeah. Uh, we do appreciate that there is a technologically oriented demographic, uh, youthful population, uh, then the intention, of course, is to improve convenience, you know, low touch post pandemic environment. Uh, so in wanting to improve uh, convenience, uh, certainly technologies is one of the main areas of investment. Uh, we also note that uh, if we can improve availability of market or economic data, you know, this can be a revenue generator for the government if the IT solutions, web portals are adopted to support private sector investment. So naturally, uh, if you improve economic performance, it bodes well for uh, the government revenues. Then in terms of the regulatory enhancement, de-risking uh, anti-money laundering, county counter-terrorist counter financing compliance, uh, legislations that uh, adopt or promote a risk-based approach. Uh, for example, speaking to opening accounts, for example, if low risk accounts require review every three years, you know, certainly there are some areas if legislatively they can change, it requires, it re removes or reduces the compliance requirements for banks, which can be extremely uh, onerous and uh, naturally expensive. Uh, regularized 
regulatory framework. Uh, at the moment, there are some tier two banks that are systemically important, uh, non-bank entities. So certainly a harmonized regulatory framework, I think that will be certainly uh, uh, important. Uh, explore avenues for creating robust investment markets. You know, there's an education factor included to improve wealth creation. As we speak to um, considering that the minimum savings rate moved from 3% down to 2%, uh, and then there's further recommendations potentially for it to be reduced further. Uh, any avenue to uh, create a robust investment market, create alternatives just for savings, you know, certainly bodes well. And we would certainly under the regulatory enhancement uh, priority want to revisit restrictions for pension funds uh, at the moment. Uh, there is a, a restriction which allows uh, pension uh, investment beyond government securities and uh, permission has to be sought each time. Uh, so certainly that would be uh, an area of uh, focus uh, for the uh, government. In terms of climate change resilience, it's certainly a buzzword, uh, necessarily so these days. Uh, uh, so banks certainly should um, uh, consider uh, climate change risk assessment for all major projects. Uh, physical planning to become more than a place to approve plans, you know, implementation, mom monitoring of projects to ensure that uh, it certainly is climate resilient. Uh, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission uh, legislation presently does not encourage widespread adoption for green energy exploitation as most certainty is required around pricing for the independent power producers. Uh, as well as a longer license term. 10 years, not enough for the investment uh, required. Transport system, that certainly came up in a few presentations before, you know, transition to EV buses to start the public transportation system for school age persons, pensioners, you know, persons going uh, further into uh, the, uh, the, the, the motherland, so to speak. Uh, so those things uh, certainly would bode well uh, if uh, more investments can be placed in that area. Uh, the other area of uh, uh, priority would be cybersecurity. You want to certainly enhance the IT infrastructure to protect consumer data. And this is especially critical for uh, the banking sector. Uh, establishment of a national security operations center with responsibility for detection response and protection from cyber incidents in collaboration with the private sector, particularly financial institutions and other critical infrastructure enterprise or institutions. And certainly for cybersecurity and the protection as we all move a transition uh, now towards uh, uh, online. Uh, so naturally, the, the, the security in that area needs to be enhanced and, and, and promoted. Uh, finally, uh, financial literacy uh, and public customer financial education with focus on the youths. Uh, revisit school curriculum to include financial planning, management, and investment tools at the secondary school level. You know, we would appreciate that certainly in any major economy, uh, there is, you need to focus on emotional intelligence, certainly, and uh, financial literacy. Uh, and that is an area I think uh, certainly the more priority can be uh, placed, you know, so persons can make better decisions uh, from youth and plan for their retirement, uh, those who are self-employed uh, and so on. So to summarize, the banking sector continue to rely on the government for consistent legislative support to further improve the financial landscape of Grenada. And as the economic environment evolves, there are numerous avenues for continued public-private partnerships that can bolster the banking sector resilience and create added value to all stakeholders. And I say thank you uh, very much, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawrence, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we'll move straight into the next presentation, which will come from the credit union sector. So I'll invite uh, my brother, Mr. Randy Good evening, Pierre. Good evening, Good evening to everyone. Um, before I present, I, please allow me to put a disclaimer out that the views that I will express during this presentation will not be reflective of my, the position I hold in the public service, but it will reflect the position of president of the league and the sector. I just find I should put that out there. And you will see why, you will see why the disclaimer is important. <laughs> so allow me to share my screen. All right, so contributions from Grenada Credit Union for 2023 budget. And the tagline, Grenada Credit Union, that's something that we want the nation to grab onto. 
we started our engagement with this question, how do we put our people first and at the center of national development? Our main objective was to represent the interests of the cooperative sector and the people of Grenada in general. As we say here, people of simple means. Before I go into the recommendations, let me just give a quick brief context that credit unions have transformed the social and economic status of many Grenadians enabling them to advance from the underprivileged class to the homeowner class by providing affordable terms and conditions for access to loans to finance a wide range of programs and projects. We continue to be a major source of growth within the financial sector, and therefore our macroeconomic significance has increased considerably. Our strategies assist in the development of self-reliance which is a key ingredient for transforming the Grenadian man or woman. We are a vehicle for socioeconomic development. Our total assets of a movement is estimated at 1.2 billion, which represents approximately 38% of GDP. 38% of GDP. Now I will go into our suggestions. We want to encourage deliberately prudent fiscal management going forward. We want to encourage prudent fiscal management. We look forward as a sector to the engagement on the revision or amendments to be made to the fiscal responsibility law. We do not support a repeal, but we will support an amendment to certain clauses or provisions within that act. We also would like to suggest far reaching pro growth strategies, policies, solutions that will address the challenges facing the poor and underprivileged. I would like to include here the category called the working poor. There are many Grenadians who are working eight to four every single day, but they are still categorized as poor. We have to try our best to fix that. I want to join with my labor colleague and ask for a review in the minimum wage, national minimum wage, with a view, and I will go far as to make a proposal, with a view to increase the hourly rate by 36%. The data that we have shows that on average, inflation would have increased by about 2.5% on average over the last 12 years. So we say, okay, then if that's the rate of inflation, let's just compound that by divided by three, so 36%. And this, there is never a wrong time to do what is right. We believe that the time is right to fix this national minimum wage matter. So I'm talking specifically to people in the domestic sector, um, the pump attendants, the security guards, persons who are getting $4.20 per hour. We, we have to change that. We also suggest that provide liquidity support for the setting up of new and emerging cooperative business ideas. We ask for removal of some of the restrictions which are affecting growth within the credit union sector. There are some things that we have the appetite to do, but we cannot do because the law is restrictive. So we are asking for some removal of these restrictions. We are asking for an establishment of an authority, an agency, a brewer, a unit, we can call it whatever name, to administer, not just to collect, to administer all professional licenses. We do not have a proper database within the sector as to how many engineers we have, how many accountants we have, how many across the professional body. So we believe that in establishing that bureau or that agency to deal specifically and exclusively to professionals, we can see some compliance in that, in that respect. Create a Grenada Credit Union government partnership to provide mortgages at discounted interest rates. Our members, they have the appetite, the desire, they have the desire to own a piece of the rock. And they want to go far and put a building on the piece of the rock, but they have some challenges. So similar to the framework of the private-public partnership, we are asking for a Grenada Credit Union government partnership. We can always discuss after how that partnership will unfold, but we believe that there are a lot of benefits in this. We are asking for the provision of grant financing to the productive cooperatives engage in developing value-added products. We have to look for ways to improve our exports. We have to look for ways to reduce our imports. So we want to promote um, export promotion and, and, and import substitution. So we believe that if the pro productive cooperative sector is given financial assistance in developing value-added products, then we can achieve that outcome. This one is major, this one is major. A reduction in the upper band of the income tax rate from 28% to 25% effective January 1st, 
2003. The data that we have suggests that government will not lose revenue, but government will get more revenue because we know the multiplier effect when persons have more spending power. And we also would like to suggest that government should consider an annual bonus payment for public servants. We saw what last year December did for the sector, the credit union sector. We saw improvement increases in deposits. We saw persons were able to pay off some aspects of their loans. We saw some improvements in our loan portfolio by just that annual payment that was made last year. So we're asking for consideration to be given for that payment to, to continue. And these, these are the views from the credit union, credit union sector. Thank you and have a good night. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Randy. Um, so colleagues, this is the end of the uh, presentation. We were expecting a presentation from Karifu. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, will not happen um, for uh, various reasons. So we want to bring the curtains down in terms of the presentations and to of course thank all the presenters for the excellent presentation and, and really bringing forward the, the views of the various representatives across the, the, the many sectors that we, we have. Um, I, we, we, the next item on the agenda is uh, open dialogue. Uh, we have uh, roughly uh, about uh, 20 minutes uh, 25 minutes, sorry, to, to, to do that. Um, so what we will do at this stage is, uh, uh, first of all, invite uh, Prime Minister to respond to all that he would have heard this afternoon, this evening, sorry. And then of course, we would open the floor for general comments from uh, other ministers and other uh, persons attending uh, the, the um, Zoom session. <clears throat> all right, thank you uh, very much, T.S. Sylvester. Uh, Mr. Cadet, on a light note, I taught my entry into politics in November of last year, uh, accomplished the payment of bonuses to public servants uh, that hitherto had never been done. So I, I don't know that you need to formally say that again. But um, on, a, on, a, on a serious note, um, let me thank all of you for the, um, the summary. Um, obviously, uh, the more detailed um, suggestions, input. Um, I hope all of it will be with the Ministry of Finance um, and the team there uh, so that we can we can review it. Um, I certainly think that there are some major structural issues uh, and I'll take one transportation. Um, now, the transportation system, and, and I'm gonna say this, my view is that the transportation issue in Grenada is not gonna be so, solved by the government providing public transportation. And I can see that clearly. It is not going to be solved by the government providing transportation or even attempting to provide transportation. It's going to be solved by the deployment of technology and by private sector involvement in, in the transportation industry and by the government being prepared to support that. But the reality is we have to find creative ways to address some of the, the challenges we face in Grenada. There are probably too many vehicles in Grenada as it stands right now, and our road network doesn't have the capacity. Um, but we have to ask ourselves the question, um, you know, and you see what technology does. Uber doesn't own any vehicles, but it's probably a, a capitalized at a billion, at billions of dollars. So the reality is we too have to be able to look at uh, how, how technology is deployed. And I'm just using transportation as one example um, for us to be able to address uh, some of the, 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 the challenges uh, that I certainly believe we can, we can overcome. Um, and obviously the government's role in those circumstances, in, in my view, is to provide the support um, with the legal regulatory uh, framework um, and the overarching architecture to allow that to happen. So issues such as addressing the transportation board um, raised by uh, uh, Mr. Patterson, I think is valid. Um, and the, the question of the, the role of the police um, and, and whether the entire licensing regime uh, should really be removed from the police and placed into uh, put in bracket civilian hands as some of the things that we, we recognize has to be addressed and has to be addressed quickly. Um, the question of the minimum wage, um, I'm sure Mr. Patterson is aware we have already constituted the minimum wage committee. Um, so it's one of the things, uh, it's one of the things we certainly expect um, that a review of the minimum wage would be would be uh, taken into, into account um, and that we'd have a national consultation on that. I also will be pragmatic. I don't know um, that we could have a new minimum wage by January, given that we're in October, if we are going to have the extensive consultations that we need to make sure that it's done, it's done properly. Um, so I, I highlight some of these because, um, you know, there have been several recommendations. I think some of them truly do uh, recognize the need for us to have some dramatic shifts um, in thinking uh, and in approach. 
Um, and so I certainly welcome uh, the partnership between this, the government and all of the stakeholders who are here tonight. Uh, I look forward to us exploring um, all, of, all of what has been suggested. Naturally, um, this budget is a single year budget cycle, um, but we have to uh, position it so that it lays the cornerstone uh, for the next couple of, of years. And I believe um, this tonight's engagement uh, certainly will help us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, if you would like to comment, please raise your hand and then we'll invite you to do so. And Ruth, if you can help me out here. I, I'm not sure if I'm seeing everybody on the screen. Yes, sir, there's nobody yet. Okay. Any comments from... Right. right, I see a couple of hands. So, um, Brad, are you on? <clears throat> yes. Um, just in, in, in reaction to um, the Prime Minister, I do agree with him that um, government can't just buy a set of buses and put on to the road. That's not practical. That's not affordable. But right now, I, I, I have been told that we have more than a thousand buses um, that are licensed and that ply the different routes. But I can assure you right now, by the old cable and wireless building, there are several dozens of persons standing there who can't get buses to St. David's. Those thousand buses are parked, probably having made too much money during the course of the day. And I'm just speculating here, right? But I think the, the, the problem is that there must be regulation. We're in a free market. The people own their buses, but the government must regulate them. And as I said, it's possible that because we have a thousand bus owners, a thousand drivers, a thousand conductors, it's a big lot of persons who no one wants to upset, but we would have to upset some of us um, to, to, to make this right. Because some of those persons who are waiting there for the bus know, and even worse, some of those that work by my brother, Mr. Fielding, all right, when they're dropped off, um, we have had issues with persons being assaulted, in particular, women folk being assaulted um, after finishing work and not being able to get a bus home and would have to pop, bomb, however you want to call it, a ride. So it, 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 there's a safety issue involved in this also. And um, in my own view, we can't expect a government to create something by magic to solve the problem. But all of us have to work together. And in the past, government has not been able to do it. So the suggestion is to that involve us all. And we may very well have the, the attitude um, the means are not all of us will be running for elections, so we may upset some persons, but we would have to do it. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Bert. Uh, can we have uh, Ms. Joseph? Hi, good night, everyone, and thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Orisha Joseph. I'm the Executive Director for Sustainable Grenadines. It's a regional NGO that works between Grenada and St. Vincent but mostly focusing on the Grenadine Islands from Bekwe all the way to Karakou of vice versa. So what I wanted to, my comment tonight is to say that while we're talking about the budget, when we talk about the budget, we also wanna know where these monies are coming from. And what I want to suggest is that the NGO sector, they have access to or can access lots of money from grant funding. And sometimes I think, that um, they are not um, kept in the loop or they're not talked about or given the platform. We do have labor representatives in the Senate. We have fish, um, agriculture representative in the Senate, but there is no NGO representative in the Senate. They are NGOs who could bring in millions and millions of dollars into the country to, to do a lot of projects that the government want to do without having to go into its coffers. So my suggestion will be the government to work very closely 
with NGOs, especially those NGOs who have the capacity to really um, help the government. For one, I could say is that we will be uh, refurbishing the fishing facility on Pity Martin. And I have had a half a million dollars sitting down there for over two years, just waiting to get approval. So there are a lot of NGOs who could really help and bring in grant, not loans, funding into the country. So it would be really great if the government could have a representative or someone to sit down with those serious NGOs who have access to bring in funding. That will ease some of the expense burden of the government and address a lot of the concern, especially relating to the areas of climate change and, and adaptation and ecosystem-based management and all of those things that Russ and others mentioned. So this is my contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fraser? Um, first of all, I think this is an awesome uh, forum. Uh, I would say big up Grenada. But my question is, um, what is the next step in translating and converting the many excellent suggestions into action and um, aligning those with the transformation agenda. Fundamental question is what's next at the micro level, at the macro level? What are some of the low hanging fruits that could be harvested within the next six months to benefit Grenada? That's my question. All right, uh, thank you very much. I, I, if I may, the, the ha we, I mean, of course you have the prime minister, you have many of the ministers uh, on this forum. And so they have heard all that would have, would have been said. Um, we also have the permanent secretaries and so on who would have submitted the budget submissions uh, uh, to the Ministry of Finance. And so the next step is, is to take a submission to the cabinet um, after distilling all of the, the, the suggestions and recommendations that we've had here. Some are, are very uh, pragmatic and could be implemented in, in short order. Um, others, of course, uh, would, would, would require much uh, longer term implementation. Uh, in fact, would require further discussions and, 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 and um, articulation and so on. So, so that is really the process. Um, and, and, and some of those that I heard, I think they can be implemented almost immediately. Uh, so so that, that is how that, that process will unfold in terms of moving all those uh, important, all those critical suggestions that we've heard today. Um, if we can have uh, uh, the next uh, person, um, Mr. Antoine, Joseph Antoine. <clears throat> uh, Mike, I, I just wanted to comment um, yes. because the Bus Owners Association are not on this forum, I don't think. Um, and I'm not sure when I look at the stakeholders that were consulted with whether they would have been engaged in the budget consultation. Um, so I think one of the things we ought to note, given that the transportation has, has, has come up, um, is, is the need to at least give an opportunity to, to them um, to, to share their views on the question of how we transform uh, public transportation in Greenland. I can say to uh, those who are on this call uh, that I've had actually some pretty long discussions with the Bus Owners Association prior to forming the government. And I actually certainly found their leadership to be uh, forward thinking, uh, dynamic, and they shared with me some of the most progressive ideas of any group of persons I've met with. In Grenada. So I, I too believe that they recognize that uh, there are significant limitations to the way in which the bus system currently operates. Um, but I think in listening to them, their fear was that the politics of Grenada that existed hitherto the 23rd of June did not permit them to engage in a in an honest dialogue with the public and for that matter, the, the, the policy makers. So hopefully. Um, now that there's a change in administration and policy makers, uh, they would be more open to, to um, engaging directly with us um, and to sharing their thoughts in an open manner as to how we can address some of the challenges uh, that we face in public transportation. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Joseph? Yeah, I was hoping not to say anything, but um, good night and let me, um, uh, um, put the protocol established, let me say just a couple of things. One, is that um, I've been hearing ministers since 1990 talk about linking tourism with agriculture. And I ask myself, when are we going to see the fruits of that? And what, what do we need to do? Because it's to me, we're wasting opportunity in terms of our, our food and so on, you know, in terms of 
rather than uh, importing Kalaloo and all these kind of things, which we do sometimes in the hotel sector. So that is one. The other issue is relating to people with disability. And I, and I, that's one of the main reasons I decided to, to come on. Um, I hope that the new administration will not be uh, uh, hesitant in ratifying. I know they have, the government have signed the um, thing then by the NDC in 2008, the Convention of People, the Rights of People with Disability. I hope this time we can ratify it through the parliament here and ensure that it become law. And so that it give people with disability some sense of, you know, a right and feel a sense of purpose. And finally, the issue of um, heat, but well, not this, but well, not finally. the issue of heat. I hope that we take it seriously because it's a really difficult thing that for a lot of people. But the final thing I want is that what we do in community development in the villages, and so we need to bring back a sense of community in our country. There's no sense of community generally. We could fool ourselves, but we need to do something where people are each other's keeper, where we are each other's neighbor. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. Um, can we have Ms. Henry Victor? Good evening, everyone. Um, special mention to you, our Prime Minister, Mr. Mitchell, and to you, Mr. P.S., for hosting us tonight. Now, what I want to bring across tonight. Uh, we're not hearing you for some reason. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, let me just start over. Um, good night, um, Mr. Prime Minister, Ms. D uh, Honorable uh, Deacon Mitchell, and to you, P.S., and to all of the, in the, the people who are here tonight. Um, something that I'd like to raise is something that I've been clamoring for a lot of years. Um, I work in the financial sector. I also part of the trade union movement of Grenada. And I am also part of the regulatory um, AML compliance team. So I have privy to a lot of information. And something that I have seen is that the government of Grenada continues to lose a lot of funds through taxation because we do not use an integrated approach into collecting our tax revenue. Okay. I want to suggest that we build a platform similar to one that we have done for FATCA and CRS to report to these international bodies, the OECD and the IRS, that we integrate the FIU the, the, along with the AML Commission, all financial industries, the National Insurance Scheme, and of course, the, in, um, the Inner Revenue Department, and we can also include intellectual property. Now, in the financial sector, there are things that I can't um, disclose, but I'm certain that we, are, we, see, we do see a lot of loopholes. So I know, especially when it comes to the, um, the well, not so much the companies, but the trading as businesses, that they can do a lot of declaration as they see it fit to IRD. Some of these people also may, may have um, declarations going in and telling NIS that they work for X, Y, and Z. But when they come to the financial sector with these financial statements, they can afford um, to, to get loans in excess of what the average Grenadian, the working salary paid Grenadian can't afford. So I think that there, that is a loophole that we can address. Um, additionally, I thought during the COVID era, we lost a pivotal opportunity to um, again register um, people in the informal sector to pay taxes. Now, a lot of these people were going to the government for assistance, right, for COVID relief help. I do hope that this, this current administration through the third phase would capitalize on these, right? So when the people um, submit for um, assistance that we do capitalize and make sure that they are registered to pay stamp tax, et cetera. I also believe that um, going forward, the I, uh, some, I don't know, maybe it, it might be through the IRD that we have special days that we clamor for people to go and register through the, I, through 
NIS and also through ta stamp tax because I think that the, that government is losing a lot of tax revenue and it's always easier to tax the salary worker and we just take these things for granted. Uh, my last contribution has to do with what Mr. Um, Fielding spoke about, the ease of opening accounts. Now, I think it's time that the, um, the AML Commission, along with the FAU, and with other stakeholders sit and have some serious conversations. We have just received the national risk assessment. We know that we are so guided by um, the, the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, and also the Caribbean, Action, the, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. But there is a need for us to sit down and, and have some serious engagement and look at the feasibility of making things a lot easier for doing business in Grenada. There is a need to balance customer service and um, regulatory compliance. So this is just my, my short contribution, and thank you for allowing me to do so. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, Randy, I'm tempted to ask you to take off your, your credit union hat and put on your early on, but I, I, we'll, we'll perhaps do that some other time. But I thank you for the, for the very important uh, contribution on the, on the tax issue and the, uh, the other issue you mentioned. Can we move to Ms. Uh, Thomas? Hi, good night. Um, Rina Pia Thomas, I'm not I'm speaking on a, a level of not journalism, but as a person with disability. Now, someone would have mentioned a little bit about persons with disability and opportunities for them. Um, but I just want to delve into it a bit. I volunteer with the Grenada National Council of the Disabled. And I must say that I think that persons with disability is on a sideline here. We, and I'm saying we, we, we are not given the opportunity that I that other persons are given. And we talk about it in the country, say, yes, we're not gonna forget them. They are part of uh, our society too. We need inclusion, but we don't. And that is the honest truth. We, we don't get inclusion in, in, many, in many instances. Um, persons with disability, when it comes to small business opportunities, is there anything like that for us? Um, how, how do we get persons to assist us in that regard? We want that we want us to, to have a, a proper education. And some of us who actually have skills, um, persons refuse to hire us. In other countries, we see things like um, arrangements made. If we have investors, let's say the, um, the CI, the, 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 the investment opportunities, if we have investors coming into Grenada and they're building a, a hotel or, or building a supermarket or whatever they decide to invest in. Why not ask us as part of the arrangement, you can hire one person with a disability who has the capability or the skill to work in your, in your, in, in your, in your company or in your business. These are opportunities we need because we talk about inclusion, but there are a lot of employers out there who refuse to hire us even if we have the skill. And I can speak on my own experience. When I came into journalism, I had to Sure, before I, before I was even given the opportunity, I had to volunteer and push myself and call on a radio station and beg and cry for somebody to give me a job when I already had the education and I had the skill. And that is the thing that we are missing. We, we're not seeing, we're hearing people talking about that we need in, in, in inclusion and we need to involve persons with disability, but yet we don't see it actually happening. It's not being implemented. And I get emotional about it because I see there are persons out there with disabilities who are, are really suffering and they don't have the opportunity. I can speak of persons that I know two young persons uh, that is in the Imani and there are situations now that it's hard for persons to get placings for them because they have a disability. We talk about planning and housing. We, we, we have uh, things in place where each uh, building needs to be ready for persons with disability. It's in their plan. But when it comes to construction of the building, it's not there. It's not there. And I don't know why. I've seen it happen in, in, in a lot of the buildings that, that has been built recently. And we expect persons to go into these buildings with disability. These are things that need to change. And we, 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 we keep saying that we're going to include us, but it's not, it's not happening. And that is the truth. We are at the back line. We're just going to be going... Uh, you know, I'm not sure what's happening. We're not hearing you anymore, but I, I, I think you, you, we've heard you. Is it my internet? I only get things like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do a. 
You are muted, Rina. Are you are you are you hearing me now? Yeah, I, I think we heard you on, on, on the point of the inclusion. Are you, do you have another point? Or, or does the same one? No, it, it's it, that I, I have another point. Um persons uh, with disability need a center. I'm talking about GNCD has a small uh, a small office, but they need a center for persons with disability. GNCD already have a piece of land. We want a center where persons with disability can go there and let's say we have schools for them or we have classes for them or we have opportunities for them. Somewhere where we can go, it's like a, 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 it's like a whole multi-purpose center for them. That is what we really want to achieve. And we can do that as a nonprofit organization uh, and we don't have uh, uh, investment. We don't have the the, the, the resources to, to go about and, and develop that. And, and that is something, again, we need a needs. Mm -hmm. that, that is another point that I, that I really I really need to put out. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Belfort? Hi, good evening. Um, I'm going to be brief, of course. Um, uh, good night. Uh, Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell, thank you so much for visiting us in the diaspora recently. Um, as we say in the culture business, thanks for the touchdown. Um, it was well appreciated. Also, a quick uh, thank you to Shevan Britton. I've been following the, uh, the nightly discussions. Really, really great job. A quick critique. Uh, the very beginning of most of the sessions, I found that the audience sort of drifted and I would suggest for future that you consider graphics and animation. Um, I found that the very beginning of the presentations were a little bit too cerebral and not offending anyone, but I found that if you use graphics and animation, it would have been better. To get to my point, one of the recurrent themes um, in the budget, in all the discussion, is linkages. We are finding out that a lot of departments and uh, a lot of units aren't standalone units. And we are finding a lot of overlap of resources and services. Um, I think we have to consider, in a lot of cases, um, avoiding duplication of effort because it seems like we could get a lot done with pairing and merging services. We see how, for example, the transportation is interlocked with Russ's, uh, you know, the, his people getting home. We see how the banking interlocks with his people opening accounts. If they have to spend less time at the line at the bank, they're spending more time at his business. To focus on my specific concern, a few years ago, I founded a company called GrenadaMarket.com. Uh, the company was set up specifically to market Grenada spices and small products. Um, I do that up to this day. What is my biggest challenge? Getting stuff off the island into New York. Um, I use Grenada Postal Corporation has been really good, really good. Um, congrats, Mr. Randall, on you know your new appointment. Now, in the old days, we used to get stuff moving through actually. Uh, British Airways, a Jamaica, um, BWE, when I just started. So stuff would get transported from Grenada up to JFK, and I would have a broker in JFK clear the stuff. Um, so I'm suggesting um, that there be some sort of pairing back on the theme of linkage between the airlift committee, Grenada Postal Corporation, to somehow have a collusion. So... So we want to bring people into Grenada, but it's important that we bring product out. And, um, and if they could find some linkage to work together to get product out. Because while you're asking, while we're planting the spice trees and while we're developing the agro industries, we're going to sell locally, but we have to get that stuff out of Grenada. That's where I come in. And other people like me come in. Um, and we can't sell the product if it doesn't come out. And secondly, we cannot sell the product at competitive prices if we don't get it at competitive prices. I actually get solicitations from Indonesia and from India because they find me online to sell their spices. I'm not going to sell their spices because I'm dedicated to Grenada. But we have to find ways to get our product out. 
our product is very unique. Somebody stated, and I'm going to wrap up, somebody stated about the uniqueness of our product. Cinnamon, for example, we have something called true cinnamon. Most of the cinnamon that's sold in the USA is cassia, which is not true cinnamon. Grenada has true cinnamon. Um, our cocoa, we have a blend of the three, uh, the three flavors of cocoa that actually came out, I think, in the Guav session um, last night, a couple of nights ago. So we have unique products. We have to market the products. But back to the question of linkage, not only do we have to market, uh, grow the products and market it, but we have to get it off the island. So it's important to consider these linkages. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lassina, I saw your hand up. Are you still? Um, we are at eight, uh, eight, what, I think we are at 8.33. So we, about the time we wanted to wrap. So if there, if there are, I saw Mr. Lassina hand up a while ago. I think she has put it down. So, so um, Ruth, I don't know if there are any hands and I, I can't see the entire uh, screen. So if, if there are none, um, what we'll do at this stage is, is wrap. I would not attempt to uh, summarize all that we've heard today. Uh, what, I, what I can say, uh, oh, hi, uh, so I see you on. I'm gonna. Yeah, please go ahead. We're not hearing you though. Are you hearing me now? I'm hearing you now, yes. Okay, good. Good night, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Pia Sylvester, my two colleagues from Library, Richard and Larry, and I think Mr. Carrot. Good night. I just want to make one small intervention for the pensioners like myself in the US about reviewing the pension life certificate. It's a little, during the COVID, it was very difficult to get a notary because you had to actually leave and you couldn't leave your residence to get a notary. So sometimes we, we got, we sent it in late. We had to send it in on the 30th of June or the 31st of December. And if you don't send it by the 30th, you don't get a pension. And sometimes you have to wait two, three months before it comes in. So I was wondering whether it's a low hanging fruit. I'm not sure if it's part of the budget process, but something that the Ministry of Finance could review. Have a, a process that's similar to NIS, where you can do that video chat in, in place of the pension life certificate, because they always want the original. The postal service is not always as efficient and quick as possible. I've had some problems where I miss a few because the post office delayed it somehow. But if you can revamp that part of it, either make it electronic or have that video chat like NIS at the end of a year or every twice a year as the, the public service is right now, just to make it easier for those of us in the diaspora because it's not easy sometimes to get a notary close to where you live. Um, so. Thank you, thank you very much, and very um, important uh, point on on, uh, on 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 the end. Um, and that's something that we have already started to discuss. So we, we want to thank you for that. It's, it's a, a, a area that the Ministry of Finance has, in fact, started uh, to explore. Um, in addition to a lot of things that we do now, a lot of forms that we do, um, the physical forms. We, the, the, I mean, a, a low hanging fruit is really to just. Uh, um, ensure that those forms are done electronically um, and, and you click send, submit and those forms get to the, the, the destination and so persons can, can move on those. So, so that's, that's a, a low hanging fruit as you, as you rightly said and the, the, uh, the pension certificate will be something that we can address uh, quite expeditiously. Thank so, I mean, you. I, yeah, I, I want to um, just make some brief comments and then I'll, the Prime Minister will have the last word or, or any other minister who wants to uh, jump in at this particular stage. But to say that the suggestions uh, and the feedback has been very rich, has been very uh, thoughtful, um, insightful, uh, prov provocative. And, and I think uh, the, uh, many of them are, are low hanging foods that, that could be implemented almost immediately. I, I, I like many of the, the, the suggestions. And I think I think um, if we if the, the idea or the, the the goal is transformation, I think some of those that uh, would have been mentioned, including the 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 bushing uh, program, I think, um, and the, the way that that could be transformed, I think is something that is uh, low hanging fruit that could be easily implemented. Um, we heard the Imani program and how that could be reimagined. I think that again is is is, a, is an important and low hanging fruit that, that that could be considered. Um, the the uh, school feeding program, 
and in terms of what is happening in the schools and and, and how that uh, could be reimagined, reimagined, uh, and, and and also have linkages with our quality, have a linkage with the health uh, to ensure that we in increase the, the the food and nutrition security in our schools, starting um, with the the school children. I think that's also an important um, uh, point that I take away from this. We we have the uh, issue with the uh, renewable energy. I know Mr. Fillin mentioned a, a solar panel or solar panels on every roof. I'm not sure how practical that is, but it's a it's a, a, a an idea. It's a, a strategy that could be explored in, in in as far as possible in terms of that transition to renewable energy. So so there are a lot of practical uh, suggestions that came from the, the consultation. And we want to thank each and every one of you for your participation. We know that, that there are many persons who are uh, listening um, on social media and, and other platforms that we, we know that you would have contributed to many of the, the ideas and so on that we've discussed here today. And as I said at the at the earlier, um, those 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 suggestions, those practical uh, solutions will be taken to the cabinet and the cabinet will uh, consider them within the context of the submissions and the allocations for 2022, uh, 2023, sorry, and the medium term, so 2024 and 2025. So we, we 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 really want to thank you. I want to thank the staff of the Ministry of Finance and of course the staff of the GIS who have been doing the the parish consultations in particular. I think those are, are the most tasking in terms of having to work the entire day and of course uh, part of the night. And of course the virtual consultation, we we believe that it's important to have that 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 hybrid approach because it reaches uh, much more people. So with those uh, few remarks, I want to turn over to the Prime Minister at this stage. Uh, thank you, P.S. Sylvester. Um, I want to assure all of uh, you who are on the call and um, those who may not be, that we're certainly committed to um, continuing the engagement um, with our citizens on a more expansive basis, not just uh, because there is a budget. Um, and to that extent, in fact, we had planned a national town hall for this Wednesday, but we uh, pushed it back in light of this budget consultation. Uh, we are hoping to start the town halls again uh, from next Wednesday, assuming something else doesn't get in its way. Uh, because we truly believe that the solutions to our challenges lie with us and no one else. Um, and so we are happy to engage, we are happy to listen, we are happy to take notes, we are happy to debate, to discuss, to intellectualize. Um, but ultimately, we also have to make decisions and we have to implement. Um, and as a nation, we have to become far more productive uh, than we have been over the last um, several decades, I dare say. So I think this is part of productivity. Uh, consulting is also working. Um, and I look forward to us continuing the engagement. I want to thank Mike and his team for uh, the hard work they've done over the last several days um, in organizing all of the consultations. Um, kudos really must be given to them. And I think it's testimony. Um, and a lot of times the public servants are criticized, sometimes justly so. Um, but I am in no doubt um, that the vast majority of them are prepared to do what is required to help uh, address the transformation agenda. And it's our job as policy makers to give them the ability to do so uh, and by giving them the necessary support, um, the necessary encouragement and the necessary resources. Um, so on that note, I want to say a special thank you to all of the uh, team that has put this together and thank all of the presenters and all of you made comments, suggestions, both in the chat and uh, live. Um, and I certainly look forward to having an enhanced and improved uh, budget process as well as an actual uh, budget itself uh, that will reflect um, the benefits of this consultation process. So thank you and a pleasant good night to all. Thank you very much, pleasant good night. Ruth, you've captured all the uh, comments, right? Just to make sure that everything is on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have some in the chat, but we'll just add it to the service. Thank you, everyone. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank have a good you. Day. Bye. Bye.